Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we are going to start talking about the, the story of the Sahaba. And uh, this is the second lecture in part of the, the four lecture series that we are having. Uh, this is part of our effort at, at Masjid Isa to, to offer a course in Islamic studies. Uh, the course is um, uh, accredited by Fairfax Institute in Northern Virginia. And those of you who will attend most of the lectures and pass a couple of quizzes that we will email you, will inshallah get at the end of the course a certificate from them saying that you have attended and passed in this course. Uh, I want to make some prelim preliminary remarks uh, as I talk about the companions of the Prophet As uh, I was preparing for this lecture, one thing that I found remarkable was that what a great job early Muslims did in keeping records and, and, and writing history. But I also recognize that, oh my God, uh, there are lots of contrary and contradictory reports which also make the job of a historian much, much more difficult to extract a singular narrative from it. It also becomes a little bit more complicated because of the sacredness of the discussion. For example, if this was just, the, if we had the same kind of reports about historical figures who had no religious significance, then we could be much more critical in our analysis of the events that transpired and the individuals that are involved in it. However, because of the very nature of the subject matter, uh, it becomes very difficult to deal with reports which are contradictory. I will share some of these contradictory reports with you and you will find out well, why it is difficult literature to handle. It's fascinating, it's very interesting. You learn so much about the social historical background about the Muslim community. You learn about the cultural and the political context in which the Sahaba live. You get to know, get a glimpse of some of the companions and their personality. But sometimes it's also very difficult to get it. For example, one of the books that I was using to, to get was this book and, uh, by Khalid Muhammad Khalid. Uh, and when I was looking at it, I thought that it looks at sometimes as if he has written just one biography in which he has used superlative adjectives of every kind. He is the bravest, he is the most honest, he is the most pious, he is the most devout, he is the most wonderful, and so on, and then just replace those names with different Sahaba, it's the same story. So in trying to portray them as the most perfect of all individuals, we tended to lose some individual aspects of their personality. However, there are other details that are interesting. So keeping that thing in contrast uh, in your mind, you must also realize that it is very important for us to know the Sahaba. Lots of people do not understand the fact that they are central to our reception of the knowledge of Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ died, there was no, not even the text of the formalized Qur'an. We don't even have a Qur'an which has been authorized by uh, Prophet Muhammad the Quran that is now official to us is authenticated by the third caliph Usman. So it is very important for us to know about him and his period and the colleagues with whom he worked. So our religion comes to us through the Sahaba. Without the Sahaba, we will have no access. We have various kinds of reports that come to them. They are called khabar, it's a report. And, uh, there are many kinds of reports, akhbar, and then we classify the reports. People often think that the Quran is special and the Hadith literature are different, but the manner in which we have received both are very similar. These are all reports that have come to us from the companions. They have taken extra care with those reports which come under the rubric of the Quran with regards to other reports. So that's why we have Hadith and we have Quran. But nonetheless, all of these are reports that have come to us <coughs> through the Sahaba. And so without the medium of the Sahaba, we would not have access. Then there are many other things which you will not find either in the Quran or Hadith literature. And that 
is fahm, that is the understanding of these sources and how to operationalize them in real life. And that we learn from the sunnah of the Sahaba, from the sunnah of the companions as to how they practiced this. And so from the practice of the companions, we learn what is Islam in many ways. So it is very important for us to know the companions, to know <coughs> their virtues, to know their contribution to our deen. For example, if you look at the Maliki Fiqh, Imam Malik refused to take any authority other than the interpretation of the companions who lived in Medina. So he said the people of Medina lived with the Prophet the longest and they watched him and they observed him and so he took the sunnah of the people of Medina as authoritative in his interpretation of Islamic fiqh. That gives you an importance of how important the Sahaba are. So in today's lecture I'm going to try and do two or three things. Two, definitely three, maybe. One thing that I'm going to do is to try and tell you uh, the different categorization of the Sahaba that Muslim scholars and the Sahaba themselves have indulged in as labeling and classifying and creating levels of the companions and the significance of this classification and clustering of different companions. And the second thing that I will do after this is to, to try and talk about some of the more important companions and some of the companions that are important for not necessarily theological reasons but for Muslims today they are of significance. For example, to talk about uh, Bilal ibn Rabah who was an African American not an African American but African <laughs> but in the context of the world that we live in today his life and his experiences and his contributions to the early slums become a sort of a norm for us to learn from on how to interact uh, across different races. So we are a community of many races, so how do we relate to people of different races? So in that context, I will talk to you about some different Sahaba. The first thing that we have to understand is that the Sahaba themselves and others the biggest two categories is the distinction between the Mahajir and the Ansar. So this is the first categorization that we come across, that the Sahaba were of two types, the Mahajir and the Ansar. The Mahajir were those who migrated with the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina. Not necessarily with him, but even afterwards and some actually even before him. So there were many companions of the Prophet ﷺ who migrated from Mecca to Medina. In fact, there were some who may have converted to Islam even after the migration of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and then migrated to Medina and they are also considered as Mahaj. There is a particular date, which I'm not sure, so I won't mention, after which the Prophet ﷺ said, now after today, if anybody migrates, they will not qualify as Mahaj. But anyway, so for even if you call migrated later, you were part of the Mahajirun. And Ansar, the word means helpers, people who were there in Medina who had embraced Islam and who helped the Prophet ﷺ and his companions when they came to the Medina. So these are the two basic qualification categorizations that we do of Mahajir and Ansar. But beyond that, there are in the literature, if you go and look at in the literature, there are many sources where we learn about the Sahaba. The Hadith literature, obviously, we learn two things. One thing we learn about the Sahaba, because they are narrators of these things, uh, most important Ahadiths are those which start with the Sahaba. The most important Ahadiths are those which start. There are Ahadiths which start with the Tabayin as the first narrator. Uh, but we always privilege those traditions where the Sahabi is the first narrator. So yes, we get a lot of information. And then we also get a lot of information about the companions from the Sira of Rasulullah and then the biographies of some of the major companions. Uh, and then later on, as the science of Hadith collection and authentication became more and more sophisticated, as the Isnad of Hadith or the uh, the chain of narration that began, we started testing it. Uh, uh, the criteria on which we test the, the validity or authenticity of hadith are at least three. 
number one, we see whether the chain is correct in the sense that if the chain is A set to B set to C set to D, we want to verify whether D actually met C and did C meet B and did B. So does the chain check out? That's one thing that we do. We also look at the content of the hadith, often verify if it is consistent at least with other known hadith and the Quran, or is it an outlier? That is a matter analysis. But we also, once we have a, an isnad, we also, I mean the scholars also started looking at the reliability of the narrators. So they would look and say, okay, A, B, C, D, check out, but you know what, we know that the Number C is a person who has not always said the truth. So this hadith, even though it has sahih isnad, we are not sure about the, the reputation of number C, so we will rate this hadith in a lower category. Sometimes it's not a question whether the person who is in the chain is a liar or not. It's, he may have other bad habits. And as a result of those bad habits, which are violation of the Sharia in some way or the other, known violations, then those ahadis are downgraded because the chain of narrators includes individuals who are less reliable from a perspective of belief. So this literature was necessary. If you are able to make these judgments, if you want to verify the authenticity of these ahadis, then you need to know. So a whole literature is called Tabahat literature, Rijal literature emerged. So there are books with, uh, one book has about 1,060 Sahaba's biographies. There is another book which includes Tabain and others with more than 2,600 biographies of individuals who are narrators and various stages of the narration of the Hadith. So, so it is, that's one of the reasons why we have so much knowledge about the companions uh, individually. Uh, after the establishment of the, the Rashidun Caliphate, during the period of Hazrat Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, he instituted a procedure by which he started giving pensions to companions of the Prophet. He started giving them Pension. He gave pension to the, the, the widows of Prophet Sallallahu the Umm al uh, the mothers of Muhat al muminin the mothers of the Ummah, or the believers as we call uh, the widows of Prophet Sallallahu So he gave them pensions and he gave the companions uh, of the Prophet who were alive pensions. But the pensions were not given in the same amount to everybody. They were given different, and that is where the categorization of uh, the Sahaba and their darajat and their levels were given. Now, some people might say, where does, I mean, how, how can you classify and level people? Are you measuring the, the quality of their faith, or are you measuring the quality of their service to Islam? There were people, their companions who did not like this. Uh, for example, Hazrat Ali did not like these different levels of uh, salaries and pensions that are given. Uh, and when he became caliph, he leveled it flat. Everybody got the same uh, amount of pensions from the, from the state. But the way it goes is, is this, uh, that uh, this is how they were divided. The highest rankings of the Sahaba were those who converted to Islam early, migrated, and were part of the Battle of Badr. They are called Badris for short. And uh, there is an ayah in the Quran which refers to them, and they are called As-Tabikhun Al-Awwalun. Okay, uh, this ayah is in Surah Tawbah, ayah number 100. This ayah is very interesting. It says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim was Sabihun of Abulun Minal Muhajirin, Wal Ansar, Alladina Attabahum, Bi Ahsanim, Radi Allah Huanhum, Wa Radu Anhu, Wa Adda Lahum Jannatin Tajri, Tahtihal Anhar, Khalidina Fiha Abadan, Dalik Al Fawzul Azim. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says in this ayah, number 100 in Surah Tawbah, and the first four runners, that is the Sahih International Translate, as sabiqun and Awalun, as the first four runners in the faith, among the Muhajireen and the Ansar, and those who followed them in doing Ihsan or doing good deeds, 
Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. So when we mention the names of the companions, when you say Umar, we say Umar radiallahu anhu, Allah is pleased with him. This comes from this ayah. It is from this ayah that we say that Allah is pleased with him. In Arabic, sometimes things which are phrased as command are also <coughs> dua. Rahmikullah. So you say, may Allah have rahmah on you. So when you say radiallahu anhu, we are also saying, may Allah be pleased with him. And you are also saying that Allah is pleased with him. Look, it's in past tense. So it, that comes from this ayah. And in this ayah, we are saying that those who were the first four runners among the Muhajireen and Ansar. And in Surah, surah al hadith ayah number 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually clearly says, who are al There are those who spent in the path of Allah and fought in and before the victory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the battle of Badr as victory. So Allah Ta'ala is clear on this that the Sabiqun and Awalun are those who converted to Islam, migrated. Now what is interesting is that before he decided on these pensions, Umar ibn Khattab invited Zaid bin Fabit. May Allah be pleased with both of them and had a conversation with him and he recited this ayah. And Zaid, he's talking to the Caliph, wanted to correct him. And he recited the verse again. Yeah. Umar recited it again. And Zaid recited it again. And Zaid recited the verse differently from the way Umar was reciting the verse. And then Umar stopped talking some time and says, you know what, I think that you are correct and we will go with the way you interpret this ayah. And you know later on that Ibn Sabit was instrumental in collecting the Quran, so obviously he had the endorsement of three caliphs when it came to trust in understanding the Quran. But the critical criticality was the way Umar ibn Khattab was reciting these ayahs, he was ranking the Mahajirin above the Ansar. And the way Zaid was reciting the ayah, he was ranking them both on the same level. And after Umar accepted them, the both Mahajir and Ansar became on the same level. So all the Sahaba, whether Mahajir or Ansar, who had fought in the level of Badr, are considered as Lawalun, they are the highest of the Sahaba. The next category of the Sahabas are those who converted before the conquest of Mecca. I will talk to you about one Sahabi. Very interesting. I was quite, it's a very fascinating story. His whole biography. Who, who, call it, who falls in this category? That he, he missed the battle of Badr. He did not fight the battle of Ahad with the Prophet ﷺ, but he was on the other side. So the second category of Sahaba are those who converted to Islam before the conquest of Mecca. And the third category are everybody else who converted after. After the victory in Mecca, lots and lots of people converted. And the most prominent names of people who converted after the conquest of Mecca are Abu Sufyan and his son Muawiyah, who converted after Mecca was conquered. Now, now while we are looking at this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in same Surah to Tawbah, that Allah has already forgiven the Prophet and the Mahajir and the Ansar and those who followed him in the hour of difficulty after the hearts of a party of them had almost inclined towards doubt. He forgave them. Indeed, he was to them kind and merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also in the Quran basically saying that he has forgiven uh, and granted maqfirah in some ways to the Prophet to the Mahajir and Ansar. So the status of the Sahaba is unquestionable. It has been privileged and uh, guaranteed by our highest source, which is the Quran. So we have uh, tendencies among some, some people to question the significance and the importance of the Sahaba that is out of the way. If you're questioning uh, the Sahaba, you are questioning the Quran. There is no doubt in my mind. So one categorization is this, those who were Badris, those who were before Mecca, and those who were after Mecca. Another category of the Sahaba are obviously the, the Khulafaya Rashidin, the four most important 
companions of the Prophet, the four who governed after him, who are in many ways Khilafatul Rasulullah, who are his successors. So you know who the four are, Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, and Ali. When Abu Bakr anhu was the caliph, he used the word Khalifatul Rasulullah. He said he was the successor of the Prophet of Allah. The community was just a community, more like a religious community at that time. But by the time Umar became the caliph, it became more of a, a political community and had more of a state-like nature. There was now a, a battle mall, there was a formal army. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so by then, he felt the need to, to have a more clearer definition of what he was doing. And, and Imam Ali referred to him as Amirul Mumineen, and he liked it. And so from there on, he became Amirul Mumineen. So both Omar and Ali preferred to be called Amirul Mumineen. And that was also the term that a lot of people used to refer to as man. So one category is of Qulfaya Rashidin, and I will talk to them after that. They will be the first category that I will talk a little bit more in detail. Now there are other smaller categories of the companions that we need to talk about. One is this: those who are described as Ashra Mubashara, the ten who have been guaranteed heaven. There was this, this, there is this hadith according to which there was somebody in the masjid who mentioned Ali. Uh, I'm assuming here that he probably mentioned Ali in a negative way. But the hadith doesn't say that. So he just mentioned Ali and one man gets up and says, I heard the Prophet wasallam say that Abu Bakr will go to heaven that Umar ibn Qattab will go to heaven, that Usman will go to heaven, and Ali will go to heaven. And he goes on to mention six more people. No, he mentions five more people and stops. And then everybody says, and who is the tenth? And he says, it is me. So the person who was narrating this hadith uh, was Saad ibn Waqqas who narrates this hadith. The ten companions are Besides the Khulfa'i Rashidin, Talha, Zubair, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, Abu Ubaida ibn al Jarrah, and Saad ibn Zaid. These are the ten companions who the Prophet guaranteed heaven. Uh, some historical analysis that people do say, well, it's quite possible that this hadith could be fabricated and not authentic because it's like you know, in the struggles, one of the things that has affected interpretation of Islam and is Islamic literature and Islamic sources is the struggle for legitimacy and authenticity between uh, the Shias and the Sunnis. So while the Shias claim they have ten Imams who are innocent and unforgivable, so some people say that maybe the Sunnis have concocted this hadith to create ten Sahaba who were like matching. These are the Sunni Imams. I don't know. Uh, but this hadith is available in Tirmidhi and Sunan Abu Dawud, the two of the six uh, authentic collections of... Uh, so you can make a big deal that they are not in Bukhari and Muslim, or you don't, but it is part of the Sitta Sahih, so it's part of the Sahih uh, traditions. And uh, once you look at the individuals, then it's not very difficult to understand why the Prophet ﷺ would have said they will go to heaven. Okay? Most of them are the earliest of Muslims. Okay? For example, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf converted to Islam probably immediately after Abu Bakr. He was Abu Bakr's friend and he heard from Abu Bakr. So he must have been, if Abu Bakr was third, that means if you take Khadija is one, Imam Ali is the second, he was a child, he converted. Uh, lots of people say Abu Bakr was the first male, grown up, adult, mature male to convert. Then, uh, then Ibn Auf would have been the fourth or the fifth. The fourth, fifth, sixth is like a discussion between whether it's Abu Dhar uh, or Saad ibn Waqqas. So many of these are among the first eight companions to convert uh, to Islam. So, but Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was also very important. He was also the kingmaker when uh, Hazrat Umar appointed the six-member committee to select his successor. He not only included Abdul Rahman ibn Auf in it, but he also made sure that any majority 
He said if, four, if there is a 4-2 majority, it has to include Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And so it was Abdurrahman who actually goes and makes the offers to various companions. And of course, he withdraws his name. And that's why he's able to play a central role. He, he played a massive consultative role, an incredible role. He not only consulted with those six people, but he also consulted with lots of people in the city of Medina over a period of time before he finally uh, first makes the offer with, with some conditions to Ali. And when Ali does not accept those conditions, he then offers the caliphate to Usman, and Usman accepts those conditions. Those conditions were basically this. He said, if we, if we nominate you as caliph, will you follow the Quran, the Sunnah, and the precedent of Abu Bakr and Umar? So Imam Ali said that he would accept the first two conditions and not the third. And then he offered the same to Usman, and Usman said, I accept all three conditions, and so Usman had become. So th these ten is one category of Sahaba that we find clustered. And if you notice that uh, I think all of them are Badris, that they are from from Sabihun al Awalun, that they were all there, they migrated with the Prophet, some of them Sahib no. Uh, I don't know how many of these are Ansar. Uh, but they are very important. For example, Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah was one of those three companions. Abu Bakr, Omar, and it was Ab uh, Abu Ubaidah uh, uh, ibn al Jarrah, who were the three people who went to Bani Saqifa when Abu Bakr was elected. These were the three Mahajir. So he's a very important companion. Uh, he was one of the three who could have become the first caliph. He was one of the six who could have become the third caliph. So he was part of the, the community that selected Usman as the third caliph, but he could also have been if he had the votes. So in that sense, he was an important companion. And even though he didn't become, uh, when Umar ibn Khattab uh, removed Khalid bin Walid as a commander, he was the supreme commander of the, the Muslim armies, he replaced him with Ibn al-Jarrah, who became the commander after Khalid ibn Walid, but he kept Khalid with him as his advisor throughout the period. So this is the third category. Uh, the next category of companions that we can cluster is the Ummuhat al muminin the wives of the Prophet Now, among this, there are, depending on who is listing them, the total concerts that the Prophet ﷺ had were 13 in number. So it is either 9 plus uh, 11 wives plus 2 uh, women his right hand possessed, or if you take some accounts, all were his wives. Uh, Khadija, Sauda, Aisha, Hafsa, Zainab, Hind, Zainab, Juwaria, Safiya, Ramla, Maimuna, Maria, and Rehana. Uh, these are the, 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 the mothers of the believers in, in many ways. And uh, it is very interesting that only two of them died before him, and most of them, uh, three of them died before him, Khadija, Zainab, and by some accounts, Rehana. There are various accounts about Rehana's life, which is very difficult to Put together, I, I don't know which one is authentic. Some say, some say that she was a slave, that he manumitted and married her, and she died one year before he died. And then others say that she didn't die, she didn't even convert to Islam, she continued to remain. She was also of Jewish origin, she can continue to remain with her people. So there are multiple and different accounts. Among the Prophet Sallallahu wives, obviously, the people who have had the most impact on Islam in many ways are Khadija. And, and Aisha in many ways. Hafsa, uh, who was the fourth one, was daughter of Umar, was very instrumental in preserving the Quran, as you know from our first lecture. She kept the, the copy of the, of, uh, the original copy that was uh, collected under the, the reign of Abu Bakr. Uh, in modern times, Khadija has become a major role model for Muslims. When Muslims talk about, our, especially in the United States and in Europe, when Muslims are rebutting these allegations that Islam marginalizes women, pushes them out of the central sphere, does not give them equal status uh, in society, 
Uh, people invoke the name of Khadija a lot because she was an independent woman, she was a businesswoman, she owned her own business. Uh, Prophet ﷺ actually was her employee, he used to work for her. Uh, and it was she who proposed marriage to the Prophet ﷺ, not the other way around. So she took the initiative, she, she found him trustworthy, reliable, very attractive person and she offered marriage to him. Not only that, but she was also much older than he was. Uh, she was 45 and the Prophet was 25. She was 40 and the Prophet was 25. And he, when she married him, she was 15 years his old. So, so, so the role, and, and in many ways, this, for 25 years that the Prophet ﷺ remained married to Khadija, he was monogamous with only one wife for 25 years. Uh, uh, the entire lifespan of uh, Khadija as his wife, it's only after his, her death that he takes another wife and that too to take care of his children who were very young, at, some, some of his children were young, especially Um Kulsum, I think was uh, very young. Uh, but, but, but Khadija's, I mean, she had a very special place in the heart of the Prophet, so much so that Aisha said in a, in a Hadith tradition, authentic Hadith, that she, that she was never jealous of anybody except Khadija because the Prophet ﷺ talked so much about Khadija all the time. And she said, the only woman that I felt jealous of was Khadija. Uh, uh, and if you, if you go back and look at the, the Prophet ﷺ's immediate reaction to his being, his learning that he's going to be a messenger of God. See, it's, it's, it's a very complicated thing to suddenly wake up to. You don't know anything. And suddenly you're hearing voices, you're seeing things in the sky, you're seeing these angels in the sky. You're beginning to doubt your own sanity. The Prophet at one time actually thought that he was going mad and he went up the mountain and wanted to throw himself from the mountain and then Jibril comes. And then Jibril shows his true form which is so awe-inspiring. So, so in all this period, this whole period of psychological state of unsure, uncertainty, what's going on, what's happening to me. It was Khadija who comforted him, who supported him, and who believed in him. And she helped him believe in himself. And so it's an important role. So, so when we talk today about the significance and the importance of women uh, in, in all kinds of roles, uh, she is often invoked. Uh, and Aisha, of course, is, is very important. He was clearly the most beloved of his wife for the Prophet. Uh, but she's more than that. After the death of Prophet Sallallahu she, she became an, a very important source of Islamic knowledge. So if you look at Bukhari and the early collections of Hadith, the top three narrators of Hadith in Bukhari are Abu Huraira, Aisha, and Ibn Abbas. These are the three companions. So nearly 1,500 Hadith traditions have come to us from Aisha. And not only that, she was a very brave woman. So she was able to talk about issues which we would never know, which are of very intimate nature of between husband and wife. And uh, we would never know uh, that these things are permitted. According to one tradition, she said the Prophet ﷺ is to kiss her and suck her tongue. This is her own word. Uh, in one tradition, she says that while he would be standing in Qiyam al-Layl, she would be sleeping right there and her leg would keep going in the area where he was praying. And so he would, while he's going in sujood, he would push her leg aside and then continue praying. And she said, then my leg would go back. And he would pray, and then he would push my leg aside, and then continue to pray. So there are lots of such personal stories uh, about the Prophet Sallallahu character that we would not have known if, it, if Aisha had not spoken and left us with these traditions. She also became an interpreter of the Quran. She also gave fatwas, many of them. So in many ways, she was also the first, one of the early uh, mushtahids of Islam. So in that sense, she's played a tremendously important role. And of course, she also had a brief sortie into politics where she, on a couple of occasions, publicly criticized 
the third caliph Usman and then of course went to war against the fourth caliph in the battle of the camel. But there are other important things about Aisha. For example, some of the things that she reports which we would never know if she hadn't been such a public figure. And not only that, it's not that she was just talking. Okay? It's not as if she's posting statuses on her social media. She had tremendous respect of all the companions. So people would go to her and ask her opinion. They would talk to her and they would seek knowledge from her. It is in that process that she said all these things that people asked her questions. Uh, and so in that sense, it's very important the role that she has played uh, in, in, in becoming a conduit of knowledge, not just knowledge of the Prophet, but also knowledge of the Quran and of course many, many traditions that come to us from her. For example, there is this whole dispute about music in Islam. Yeah. Well, those who say that music is okay, they rely on traditions that Aisha reported. Aisha said one day that there was the Eid celebrations going on and there were people who were playing music outside and she wanted to see and the Prophet actually helped her look over the wall outside what was going on till they were playing. Then she also reports about organizing a party in her house for a wedding and the Prophet said, don't the people of Medina like music? And so, so she had people singing. In fact, there's another tradition in which uh, Abu Bakr comes to the Prophet house and he finds some people playing music and singing and he's very upset and he scolds Aisha and the Prophet says, leave her alone. And so they have used these traditions to, to, uh, to make the case that music is permitted in Islam. So there are lots of such uh, important social and fiqhi issues uh, which are resolved uh, based on the traditions that Aisha has reported. So one category of companions uh, is the Ummul Mu'mineen category. And then if you move away from this, so we have so far seen the three categories of those who converted and fought in the Battle of Badr, then who converted before Mecca and those who converted after Mecca. And then you have the Ashra Mubashra, the Ummul Mu'mineen, Khulufai Rashidin. And another category that I want to talk about is the category that we talk about as Ahl al-Bayt. It becomes very controversial uh, because sometimes Ahl al-Bayt is also used as a reference when we are talking about the Shia. Uh, I remember in Jordan once, I gave a talk and I was coming out of the talk and a gentleman came and asked me, are you Ahl al-Bayt? And uh, I don't know what he wanted to ask me. Uh, I'll tell you why he thought I, I was Ahl al-Bayt. I said, are you saying I'm a Sayyid? <laughs> because where we come from in India and Pakistan, it's very important that people say we are Sayyid, Sayyid, Sayyid. We are from the family of the Prophet. We are descendants of the Prophet. So I said, no, I'm not a Sayyid, I'm a Khan. And uh, he said, no, 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 are you Ahl al-Bayt? He said again, I said, I don't know what you're asking me. He said, are you Shia? I said, no, I'm not. So I said, why are you asking me? He said, because you talked about Abu Dhar. I said, okay, Abu Zar is an important companion. I'm sure Sunnis also talk about Abu Zar. You don't have to be Shia to talk about Abu Zar. I'm going to talk about Abu Zar again today. But nevertheless, Ahl al-Bayt is, is, is a very important term. First, we need to understand what Ahl al-Bayt means. Ahl al-Bayt means, very simply, it means the people of the house. Literally, it means the people of the house, but it is referring to the Prophet's family. So the word Ahl al-Bayt is the Prophet's family. Uh, there are, there is a broader term of Ahl al-Bayt, which means anybody who is related to the Prophet ﷺ is Ahl al-Bayt and all his descendants. Uh, the Shia give a lot of importance to the descendants of Ali and Fatima and they are all Ahl al-Bayt. The Sunnis also include the wives of the Prophet ﷺ as Ahl al-Bayt. So for example, for some people, Aisha would not be Ahl al-Bayt. But for Sunnis, Aisha is Ahl al-Bayt and so is Khadija and all of them. The word Ahl al-Bayt comes in the Quran a couple of times. And in those couple of times, it's very clear that it supports this position that I'm suggesting to you. For example, uh, the verse uh, in Surah al ahzab 33, 33, easy to remember, you can go and check. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in 33, 33. He says, and abide in your houses and do not display yourself 
as the display of the former times of ignorance and establish prayer and give zakat and obey Allah and his messenger, Allah intends only to remove from you the impurity of sin. O people of the Prophet's household, O people Ahl al-Bayt, this is where the word Ahl al-Bayt, O people of the Prophet's household, and purify you with extensive purification. And elsewhere, the Quran directly speaks to the wives of the Prophet as Ahl al-Bayt. So the Quran very directly refers to the wives of the Prophet as Ahl al-Bayt. But, as I said, there is another term called Ahl al-Qissa, which is also used sometimes as a, a centerpiece of this discussion of Ahl al-Bayt. Ahl al-Qissa refers to a particular hadith. The hadith is actually narrated by both Aisha and Fatima. Aisha says that one day the Prophet ﷺ left home carrying a blanket. That's what Qissa is, a blanket. And uh, once he went out, she says, she doesn't say where he went. She says he went out and then his grandson Hassan joined him. And then Hussein joined him. Then Fatima joined him. And then Ali joined him in the, the blank. So, oh, Qissa, so it's called, they are called Ahl al-Qissa. Fatima narrates this differently. She says, one day the Prophet ﷺ came home. He was not well. He was, I think, feeling cold or had fever. So he wanted to be covered. The blanket was a Yemeni blanket. It's very interesting. In her tradition, it actually specified that the blanket was a Yemeni blanket. And she covers him with him. And then, then the two grandchildren who are there, they come running and they just they want to get him. So when Ali sees that, he comes in and says, okay, I want to join you too. And he joins. So all three of them are in the blanket. And Fatima finds it so enduring that she wants to join him too in the blanket. So they're all in the blanket. And when they are in the blanket, the Prophet ﷺ then recites this ayah again from Surah Al-Hazab, but only the last part, and says, Allah intends only to remove from you the impurity, O people of the Prophet's household, and to purify you with extensive purification. Now this is very important. So the Prophet ﷺ says that this is Ahl al-Bayt from that, even though the hadith is called the hadith of Ahl al-Qissa, the people of the blanket, because he narrates this ayah in that. Uh, which invokes the term Ahl al-Bayt. This is also described as Ahl al-Bayt. There's one very interesting episode. During the Arab, early Arab society, they used to have a practice called Mubaha. So for example, when two people are arguing and contesting something about the truth, they would say, okay, we will invoke curses. We'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to curse those of amongst us who is not speaking the truth. So it was an old practice. So in the last few years of the Prophet Sallallahu's uh, life in Medina, the bishop of Najran and Christians come and they debate with him extensively. And they are debating with him about the creation of Isa. And so they are talking about the Immaculate Conception. The Prophet ﷺ says, I accept that he was born. And they are debating about it. And they are trying to say this is a miracle, etc., etc. And so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually, there is a revelation. Uh, you will find that in Surah Al-Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Inna Masli Isa, Inna Laha ka Mislihi Adam, Khalakahu min Turabin, Thumma Khala Lahu Kun Fayakun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, wow, what's, I mean, why, why are you making the big deal about the creation of Isa? Because to me, the creation of Isa is just like the creation of Adam. If Isa was created without a father and a mother, what's the big deal? I created Adam without a mother and without a father. So, for, so God is puzzled as to why the Christians are making such a big deal that Jesus did not have a father. And then he says, and the truth from your Lord, so do not... Be among the doubters. Al haqqu min rabbika, fala takunu min al mumtari. So he's saying the truth has come to you from Allah. Allah has told you about these things. I said kun fayakun, and that's how I created Adam. That's exactly how I created Jesus. So why are you fighting? Don't become among the deceivers. And then he says, then whoever argues with you after this is addressing Prophet Sallallahu After this, the knowledge has come to you. Say, come, let us call our sons 
and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves, then supplicate earnestly together and invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars. So Allah, Allah is telling the Prophet that now that they still refuse to believe the truth, call them among yourself. So you take your family, your women, your children out there and call, challenge the Christians to come and say, now let's invoke Allah's curse. If I'm wrong, may Allah destroy me. If you're wrong, may Allah destroy you. So when the Prophet ﷺ did this, he went out, he took his blanket and he took with him only Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein after this. So that is why this Ahl al-Bayt thing is so much more important and so much of discussion goes on. Now one more interesting uh, comment about this. Many, many years later, Harun al-Rashid, who was an important uh, caliph, Umayyad caliph, uh, ran into one of the Shia Imams, I don't remember what the Imam's name was, I think Imam, sixth or seventh of the Imam, and he says, I don't understand Imam, why you refer to yourself as the son of Rasulullah? Why do you call yourself the son of the Messenger of Allah? Don't you know that family heritage goes through father to son? And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not leave any sons behind. You're all the children of Ali. You should call yourself as the sons of Ali. Why do you call yourself as the sons of Muhammad? And so the Imam responds by saying, said, do you know that Jesus did not have a father yet in Surah Al-Imran and other places? He's included as in the family of the prophets. So just as Jesus who did not have a father, so his Nisba went through the mother, through Mary. So he becomes the family of the Imran because of Mary. That's how Jesus is included in the family of Imran. So he's getting his lineage through his mother. So similarly, I'm getting my lineage through my mother, Fatima. It was an interesting observation that he made. And finally, the children of the Prophet ﷺ were also Sahabis. In many ways, they are not. Uh, According to most traditions, the Prophet ﷺ had two sons and four daughters. According to some reports, he actually had three sons and four daughters. All his children died before him, except Fatima, who died just six months after him. His, he had a son called Khatim ibn Muhammad. He was with all these six children. Five of them were with Khadija and one with, with the Mary, the Copt. So Khatim ibn Muhammad was his son. So many times people would refer to the Prophet ﷺ as Abu Qasim. That was his, uh, his nickname as Abu Qasim. Uh, he had daughters Zainab, Rukhaya, Umm Kulsum, and Fatima. Rukhaya and Umm Kulsum both ended up marrying Usman. And so Usman is often referred to as the person with two lights because he married two of Prophet ﷺ's daughters, not one but two. Uh, and then Ibrahim ibn Muhammad, who was the youngest and who also died. He was born to Mary. Uh, now I want to go back to the, the period of the Khulfaya Rashidin and talk to us and say, when we say Sahaba, the basic definition of the concept is anybody and everybody who saw Prophet Muhammad wasalam, converted to Islam and made some kind of contact with him is considered as a Sahabi, period. And he did not change his religion before he died. So basically, if you have met the Prophet, you've converted to Islam, and then you die a Muslim, then you are a Sahabi. There are others who met the Prophet, like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, they, they did not convert to Islam. So we don't consider them as part of the Sahaba. And there were some who actually met him, converted to Islam, and then left Islam. One of his wives, Ramla, was like that. She was married to a companion who then went to Abyssinia and then he left Islam and converted to Christianity. And so he divorced his wife and the Prophet Sallallahu then remotely married her and then she came and lived for a couple of years with him before she also died. So, so there are examples where some companions have left the religion and so they are not companions anymore. Now, if you take that as a definition of the Sahaba, then at the time of the conquest of Mecca, that means the second category of Sahabas, those who were Muslims before the conquest of Mecca, would be 10,000 in number. 
and by some estimates, the number of people who attended the, uh, the Qutbatul Wida of the Prophet Sallallahu the Qutbah that he gave in his final Hajj, uh, there were 124,000 by some accounts and 70,000 by some accounts, the number, number of uh, Muslims. At the Battle of Hunayn, probably at that time, there were 70,000 Sahaba. So anybody who converted and met the Prophet Sallallahu uh, are considered as Sahaba. But people actually try to say, well, the, re the reason is important. The reason is important because the Prophet Sallallahu said that the best generation is my generation. And that is the companions of the Sahaba. The next best generation is the next generation who is the Tabayin, and the next generation is the following one, the Tabay Tabayin. So when we are looking at Hadith literature, we are, when we are looking at juristic issues of faith, of making laws, it becomes very important whether the, this is the opinion of a Sahabi or not, who is narrating the Hadith. So for legal purposes, it becomes very important as to how we define a, a companion and the Sahaba. Uh, so, but nevertheless, there are contemporary scholars like uh, Javed Ramdi of Pakistan, for example. Javed Ramdi of Pakistan doesn't accept this definition of the Sahaba as Sahaba. He says only those people are companions who have actually had extensive, extensive exposure to the Prophet who have. See, the word Sahaba is like Sahaba, right? To have companionship. So, if you have not had the Sahaba of the Prophet you have not had personal education from him, personal training. He's not looking at you and saying, don't pray like this, pray like this, do this, no, don't recite the Quran like this, you're incorrect. He corrects you. On a daily basis, he's teaching you the faith for 23 years. Like Abu Bakr, you can imagine Abu Bakr. 22 years, he was his best friend. And learning from him every day. Abu Bakr was actually older than the Prophet by two years. He used to say, I'm older than him, but he is greater than me. So, so there is a huge difference from that as opposed to a person who comes to, to Hajj or comes to Medina once, meets the Prophet, converts to Islam, and then goes away. And he has had five or ten or thirty minutes of interaction with the Prophet. And how can they both be the same Sahaba? And so Javed al Ghandi is making a very interesting argument that, yes. But in the real sense, when people are... When we talk about Sahaba, when we're lo looking at it from four sources of Viagra, we're talking about 50 to 60 people. So I'm going to briefly talk about some important companions from, from this list. Uh, okay. For example, if you take the period of the Polophi Rashidin, clearly among the four companions, the person who had the greatest impact on Islam is Hazrat Umar ibn Khattab II. Uh, there was no question about his legitimacy. He was nominated. There were very few people who questioned him. And uh, most of the supporters of Ali, there were more noise at the time of the selection of the first caliph than at, at the point of Umar. The empire expanded considerably. There was more of institutionalization. You know, there are lots of these debates about the word bidah and bidah hasana, for example, whether this is Hasana, or whether Hazrat Umar actually started, restarted an old tradition. So the people who deny the validity of any kind of innovation say, oh, he did not in innovate when he established uh, the Tarawi, but what he basically did was to revive a tradition which the Prophet Sallallahu had actually established. But Hazrat Umar did lots of incredible things. For example, he was the first to distinguish between police and army. And he realized that the army and police are two different things. The soldiers can't, those who go to fight and those who actually mean. He was the first one to actually start postal system. We had a postal system in the Muslim world, which was uh, an, an innovation of Umar bin Khattab. The pensions that he gave, the Baitul Mal as an institution which he took and gave pensions to the companions. A lot of people at that time were upset. They said, are you rewarding these people for the services that they did for Islam. They are doing this fisa bilillah. They are doing this for the hereafter. So why are you giving this wealth now? One of the companions who refused to take pension was Abu Dhar. He said, I don't want, I, whatever I do is for Allah. One day a companion comes to his house when he's banished and looks around his house and he sees nothing. 
So he looks at Abu Dhar and says, where are all your possessions? And Abu Dhar said, I have shipped it to the house in the hereafter. I have another house there and that's where everything is. Basically meaning he gave it away in charity. He has nothing here because it's all about being there. So Hazrat Umar is perhaps one of the big key central figures in Islamic history. He brought stability to the early empire, institutionalized and began modernization of the Muslim empire. It was under it was his idea to collect the Quran and to 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 preserve it when he was the first to realize that people who had memorized the Quran are dying and we need to transition from oral tradition to written tradition. <coughs> so we transition. Until then, the Quran was an oral tradition and then it became a written tradition much later, but that was the beginning of the first step. There are lots of many things, like for example, some of his decisions, like his decision to dismiss Khalid ibn Walid as the commander-in-chief. The Prophet himself had said that any army that is commanded by Khalid ibn Walid will never be defeated. And when Khalid ibn Walid was appointed commander by Abu Sufyan, his first question was, do you want me to kill Muhammad? And Abu Sufyan said, no, he's my relative, how can you do that? All I want you to do is to defeat them. And so, so the battle of Ahad, Khalid bin Walid was the other side of the commander in many ways. It could be considered as a defeat of even the Prophet But people used to think, once this word got around, that even the Prophet said that Muslim armies will never be defeated as long as Khalid bin Walid is the commander, that people started thinking that they are winning because he's the commander, not because they're fighting for justice or fighting for truth or they're fighting on the side of God. So. So Umar fired him for those reasons and fired him and then replaced him with uh, Ibn Jarrah. So, so, so there are many such decisions he's made. I mean the most prominent is his entry into Jerusalem. When he came to Jerusalem, he came with one slave. And they had only one camel left when they were finishing the journey. And they started switching. So his slave was riding for some time and he was riding. So when he actually entered <laughs> Jerusalem, it was the turn of the slave to ride. So the slave was riding the camel and Umar ibn Khattab was walking the camel. So the people, the rabbis, etc., who were receiving them thought that, that the slave on the top of the camel was the caliph and the caliph was the slave. And they started talking to him and he said, no, no, he's the man. Talk to him. And then he took another interesting decision when he was talking with them. He was sitting in the, whole, the temple, the Jewish temple. He got up and went out and prayed. And they said, why are you praying outside? And Umar said, if I pray inside, I think subsequent of my followers might convert this into masjid because Umar prayed here. And so Umar went out and prayed. So there are lots of these decisions that Umar has made. So in many ways, he has become a role model for Muslims in terms of good governance. If you were to take a poll of Muslims worldwide and ask them and say, write down one name in your head, if you want to have a ruler, if he's made in the caste of somebody, how would you want him made? If you want a president of your country, how would you want? I guarantee you that he'll probably get 82, 83% of the vote. The Shia would obviously say Ali, so 15% of the vote is gone there, and then maybe there might be some people who may not understand the question and may answer something else, but 82 to 85% will say Umar ibn Khattab. In fact, when I travel to the Arab world these days, I think that the reason why the Middle East is so susceptible to dictatorships is because they are searching for a benign dictator like Umar ibn Khattab. They want somebody like Umar ibn Khattab to come back and take over and fix all our problems. So Umar ibn Khattab is that's why very, very important and central to this tradition of Islam and the Khulfa Rashidin period. And also clearly the wars hardly, even though he was assassinated by uh, a own citizen, Umar actually met the guy. And he says that when I met him, my heart went cold. When he met the guy and said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm from Persia, I have come here. And the next day in the Fajr prayer, he came and assassinated him. Uh, Umar. So Umar. Is it about the money dispute like between two persons which can complain that it was a Murira or something? Well, there are, there are two kinds of reasons yeah. for the assassination. One is the personal 
issues for this, but there were also the political resurgence. Uh, already what had happened was that the Muslim empire had gone into non-Arab territories, like the Persian and the Byzantine, etc. So there was already this hierarchy of Arab governance over non-Arab people. Even as early as Hazrat Umar, there was a Persian backlash already beginning to take place. And so people say that is why he was a Persian who, who he, he did that. Uh, from among uh, the, uh, the, the, the Ashra Mubashra, I've also talk, already talked to you about some of these companions. I want to take an example from among the other companions who are not mentioned. For example, take the case of uh, Salman al-Farsi. Salman al-Farsi was, was a very interesting person from his, his whole life. is a, an example of the search for religious truth. He was born in Persia and when he was a child, he was born in a reasonably elite family. So his family was very wealthy. Uh, he was going to inherit a lot of wealth and so his parents wanted him to study and become. But during his pursuit of knowledge, he ran into Christian monks and converted to Christianity and ran away, basically. His mother ca captured him. In fact, if you read the stories of the Sahaba, you'll come across a lot of strong mothers who have kept their children, literally captured, kidnapped. There was a Sahabi called Musaib, who's called the diplomat of Islam, whose mother was very aristocratic, and she was horrified when the son converted to Islam, and she locked him up. <laughs> in her house and he actually escaped. And the same thing with Salman al-Farsi, his mother also locked him up and she didn't want But Salman al-Farsi actually escapes, actually leaves Persia and goes away into Syria. So while he's living with these monks, uh, one of the monks tells him that there is a prophet who is going to come in Arabia, who is going to be the final prophet and the true prophet of God. And so Salman al-Farsi, in search of Prophet Muhammad, actually comes to Mecca and he's enslaved. So while he's a slave, <laughs> one day he sees Prophet Muhammad and he's running around. He's like trying to get behind the Prophet. And the Prophet looks around and looks at this man, this foreigner is trying to get behind him. And then he picks up his shirt and says, is this what you're looking for? So the seal of the Prophethood was a mark on the Prophet's shoulder between his two shoulder blades. And that is what Salman al-Farsi was trying to figure out. Because the Christian monks had told him the way you will recognize the Prophet is by the seal on his back. And so some people narrate that on the night of the Miraj when the Prophet ﷺ was operated upon and his heart was purified, the left that mark was left. Some people say that it was born. He was born with that mark. But nevertheless that's when Salman al Farsi converts to Islam and the Prophet ﷺ then buys him out of slavery. And there are lots of interesting uh, episodes. He was it was his idea to drink uh, to to dig the trench in the, the war of trenches because he had seen trench warfare being used by Persians. And later on, Salman al-Farsi one day actually comes and has a very interesting conversation with... Um, one interesting thing is that many of these Sahabas have triggered revelations because of the things they did or said or asked. There are revelations. Hazrat Umar is to say that God has agreed with me on two issues. And one of them is hijab. So God has agreed with me and actually sent the command for hijab because he wanted. So Salman al-Farsi comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, What about these Christians who believed in you before you? What about these Christians who were pious people? They believed in God, but they also believed in you. And that's how I found you. So the Prophet ﷺ actually said, Whom fill Ahl nar He said, they are from the people of the fire. And Salman al-Farsi goes away very disappointed and he can't understand why those Christians who believed in God, who were so pious, all they did, they were monks, they were not just ordinary people, they were monks who were constantly worshipping all the time, who knew that the Prophet of Muhammad ﷺ was going to come and was worshipping. Why would they go to hell? And then the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, which says if you are a Jew, if you are a Christian, or if you are a Sabian, you have nothing to worry and nothing to fear. And if you believe in God on the Day of Judgment, this ayah, Surah Al-Baqarah 2, 262, it is repeated in Surah Al-Maidah, verse 69. So what is interesting is that if you were to write, a, to give a talk about uh, multiculturalism in Islam, 
you would talk about Salman al Fars as the Persian. But if you were also to talk about pluralism in Islam, about respect for other religions, and then you will have to talk about these verses which talk of pluralism in Islam, you would also then talk about Salman al Farsi. So, Salman al Farsi is in that sense very, very important. I also like Abu Dhar a lot. Uh, some companions, uh, I think it was Rashid Rida, uh, an Arab intellectual who, who used the word and said that, first he said that Abu Dhar was the Muslim socialist, first Muslim socialist. And then he corrected himself and said the first socialist because he realized that Abu Dhar precedes Marx and other socialists. Because Abu Dhar anhu, he was either the fourth or the fifth person to convert to Islam. He converted it through Abu Bakr. And it is very interesting because he is often portrayed as this person. He belonged to a tribe which was like a gangster tribe. The whole tribe used to just go around robbing people. Uh, Abu Dhar was one of those who was like not into that <coughs> tribe and he was lived really very poor and uh, not very sophisticated, very crude. And so he got to know the Prophet from the very beginning, like he converted to Islam in 611 and died 20 years after the Prophet. So he was with the Prophet 22 years in, in the Sahaba of the Prophet. And, uh, he was a very emotional man. Uh, he often wanted responsibilities, and in one tradition, the Prophet ﷺ actually tells him, you're weak. Mm -hmm. And in other places, the Prophet ﷺ says, may Allah have mercy on you, Abu Zar, because you're going to make your life difficult for you. He actually says, predicts that you may die alone. And that's what happens when Abu Zar starts seeing Hazrat Umar giving pensions to people. He says, what is going on? Why are you doing this? And then one day, Rasman gives, uh, according to the tradition, 300,000 to somebody. He gives 100,000 dirhams to Zaid ibn Sadiq, the one who collected the Quran. And Abu Zar just goes ballistic and says, why are you giving people money for serving God? He, he refused to believe that. He didn't accept the fact that in an Islamic society there could be rich people and poor people. Abu Dhar could not accept that. To him, an Islamic society was not an Islamic society if there were inequalities and in inequities. So he basically believed in redistribution of wealth. So Osman sent him off to Damascus and said, you move to Damascus. And there, of course, he started giving Muawiyah a lot of trouble. Muawiyah built a big palace, and Abu Dhar went to Muawiyah and said, what is this? If you have built this palace with the money of the people, then you have violated their amana. It's basically theft, right? You're building money out of Baitul Mal, then you have violated their amana. But if you have built this palace with your own money, then this is israf. So either way, he didn't approve of it. This is either violation of amana or this is israf. And how can you, as a Muslim, do this? So, so Muhammad actually wrote a letter to Osman saying, "Then get him out of here." So Osman then told him. Then he himself went to Osman and said, "There is this little village in the east of Medina, far away." in the jungle, can I move there with my wife and daughter? And Usman said, yes, go. So he lived there alone for 10, 15 years before he died. And there were occasionally people would go to him to seek hadith and traditions and they would. So this person who went there, uh, I think it was Muawiyah later who tried to send him 300,000 dirhams. And he refused to accept them as any of the cumulative pensions. He didn't want any pension or anything. But what was also interesting is that when he died, only his daughter was there. She didn't know what to do with him. Like, how, how will she bury? So she went out and there was a whole bunch of people going to perform Hajj. So all of these would-be Hajjis, they went to Abu Dhas and they prayed Salatul Janala. So he was like literally a large, large number of crowds. So he was a very unusual person, but very important person. And, and so, so, so for, for Muslims today, they need to know these people. They need to understand their personalities. So you could be a Muslim, you could be taught Islam from the same source as Abu Bakr and Omar and yet have such a different interpretation. So you could see as to how the rest of the companions dealt with Abu Dhar. You can admire the position that Abu Dhar took, which was no compromising on any end. He didn't believe in pragmatism. He didn't believe in realism. He was so obsessed with the principle, especially on equity and wealth equality of wealth, etc. But 
The others also dealt with him with a lot of respect, and a lot of compassion, even though he was basically uh, a source of trouble and destabilization for many of the people who were governing. So people should look and study about him. Another companion that I want to talk to about is about Bilal. Bilal ibn Rabba was from Abyssinia, he was a slave. He heard about the Prophet he came and listened to the Prophet and he converted to Islam. And once he converted to Islam, his owner found out and he used to torture him all the time. And the more the owner tortured him, and all the Ibn Rabbah used to say is, one, 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 one. He only believed in one God. And then Abu Bakr found out that there was this black slave who was being tortured by his master and who had converted to Islam. So Abu Bakr went and bought him and then freed him. And for many years, he actually lived with, with uh, Abu Bakr. One day in Medina, one of the companions comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says that I think we should find a way to call people to prayer. People are so far away distributed. How should we go? Now there are many narratives. The most popular story is the one that I'm telling you now. So one of the companions said, you know, like the Christians, we should have a bell. We should ring the bell, then people can come to prayer. Uh, and then, then Bilal says, no. One of the companions said, no, we should not do that. We should call people to pray. We give a zan to call people to pray. And the companion says, well, Prophet says, yes, okay, we should do that. And then he picks Bilal and tells him, climb up on the roof and call the azan. So he climbs up on the roof and then he calls the azan and people come. So, so, it is an interesting episode. For example, this is the best example of how Islamic law is made through shura. Sharia from shura. This is one of the best examples of how Islamic law came out of shura. The Prophet ﷺ just consulted. So this is the dominant view. This is the dominant view held by most. There are some marginal views. Some people say, no, Azan is so important. How could you? How could Bilal come up with it? So there is one narration where it says that a Sahabi saw it in his dream. Somebody came and taught him the Azan in his dream and then he came and told the Prophet ﷺ of the entire Azan. The Prophet said, this is great. And then they taught it to Bilal and asked him to call because he had a loud voice. But this is a small minority in a weak hair tradition. There are others who actually say that uh, it was in the Miraj that, uh, that one of the angels came out and taught the Prophet ﷺ, what the azan is, and then the Prophet came back and taught this to Bilal. But Bilal gives azan. As I told you during the khutbah today, there is one moment of interaction with the Prophet ﷺ and Bilal which is very important. You know, of heaven before me, what is this special thing that you are doing that God is so happy with you? Right? And uh, Bilal responds by saying, first he's puzzled, he doesn't know what he's doing, and then he says, oh, it's possible that after I do wudu, I pray. So it's called, now we call it Tahiyat al that when you pray, if you do a wudu at an odd time, just pray two rakats, four rakats, as much as you can, uh, out of respect for the wudu. Like when you come to the mosque, you pray Tahiyat masjid similarly you do Tahiyat al uh, How much more time? Can I just five more minutes? Or shall I stop now and take some time? Uh, Yes, I wanted to talk about one companion who converted to Islam after the two battles. And this companion is Abdul Rahman, who is the son of Abu Bakr. The prophet, Abu Bakr was the, probably the, there was the third, right, the first man to cover, and his whole family, uh, Aisha was also his daughter, who was converted to Islam, was, was Muslim. But he had a son. Abdul Rahman Abu Bakr, bin Abu Bakr, who never converted uh, with early on. And in both the battles, in the Battle of Badr and Battle of Ahad, he fought on the side of the Meccans. And in the Battle of Ahad, before the battle starts, he comes forward. He was a very ferocious warrior and he challenges the Muslims and says, who wants to fight with me or who wants to die now? Come out. So Abu Bakr gets up to take up the challenge of his son. And the Prophet ﷺ sees Abu Bakr going. He says, sit down, we need your wise advice. You're not going to go fight your son, because one of the two is going to die. So Abu Bakr sits down. 
Later on, at the, at the time of the Suleh Hudaybiyah, that's when he converts to Islam. And then he tells Abu Bakr, you know, on more than one occasion I had a chance of killing you in Badr, but I let you go. And Abu Bakr said, you're very lucky because if I had a chance to kill you, I would have killed you. So this, this companion was very interesting. He was a very ferocious warrior. But what's interesting is that four generations of his family were companions. His father, Abu Bakr, was companion of the Prophet The grandfather, Abu Bakr's father, also converted to Islam. And his son, Abdul Rahman's son, also converted to Islam. So his son, his father, and his grandfather. So you have four generations of people who converted to Islam in his family, and they were all companions of the Prophet. Uh, and this man later on does not take bayah on Muawiyah, and then he actually has to run away and hide in his sister's house. He goes and hides in Aisha's house. And then later on, he goes away further away from Mecca and Medina. So he, he was also a very important companion. So you can see that there are lots of people who converted late to Islam but became important. He fought in most of the battles uh, that Muslims fought. Uh, and he had a long life. He continued to live life like that. Uh, there are two other companions who, you know, for, for those of you who are reading the notes, I've already sent you their brief biographies. One is Ibn Masud, anhu, and the other is Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas is also very interesting. Ibn Abbas's mother was the second Muslim, second woman to convert to Islam. And her son, Ibn Abbas, was born a Muslim. But Ibn Abbas's father, who is cousin of the Prophet <coughs> actually did not convert to Islam early on. In fact, he converted to Islam very, very late. So it's interesting, but Ibn Abbas, and Ibn Masud are the two people who the Prophet kept very close to them, to him. And in fact, he once embraced Ibn Masud. And uh, he embraced him so that the chest of the Prophet is in complete contact with Masud's chest. And he prays that God give him knowledge of the Quran. Uh, for those of us who live in India, Pakistan, you must have heard this phrase that Ilm Sina Basina travel. You know, when you say that knowledge transfers from chest to chest. They are referring to this episode where the Prophet ﷺ embraces Ibn Masood and, 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 and prays that he should have knowledge of the Qur'an. Uh, and he was also one of the companions who actually collected the Qur'an on his own. So he had his own manuscript of Qur'an. Ali is also supposed to have collected. And of course Ibn Abbas also has collected his own manuscript. Uh, until he died, Ibn Masood did not uh, use the sequence that the Osmani uh, Masaf has used. He had his own sequence of the Quran. Uh, Ibn Masud was one of those who comes from a very lowly tribes in the Arab hierarchy, social hierarchy. So, so he was constantly marginalized. Uh, but it was his knowledge that that gave him significance and prominence. Uh, and so his knowledge of the Qur'an, and uh, he was authorized by the Prophet to teach Qur'an to others and so on. So Ibn Masood is also very important. He has uh, narrated many, many traditions. So if you are reading classical tafsirs of the Qur'an, if you're reading Tabari, and if you're going back early on, you will find that uh, Ibn Masood is cited very often in understanding. Ibn Abbas, is actually attributed. The first tafsir of the Quran which is written is the tafsir of Mujahid. But there is also a tafsir, it's called Tanweer ibn Abbas, a tafsir of ibn Abbas, but there are some people who question whether it was written by ibn Abbas himself or not, but they all agree that what is in it is what Ibn Abbas's positions were on various issues. So, so you could argue that the first uh, commentator in many ways, the first Sahabi commentator in the formal sense of the Quran was Ibn Abbas. He was very young. When the Prophet died, he would probably have been 12 or 13 years old, but he devoted the rest of his life uh, to the study. He was always a scholar. Uh, and. Uh, 
it is very interesting that during his entire life he was a very strong supporter of Ali but after the death of Ali he, he was okay working with Muawiya. So people found that very descriptive because he was very pragmatic when it came to power. He was not interested in power disputes uh, or power, who was the caliph. He was more interested in knowledge accumulation. Uh, so accumulating knowledge and disseminating knowledge. And Ibn Abbas is probably the second highest number of hadiths uh, that he has narrated uh, after Abu Huraira. Uh, a couple of words about Abu Huraira because he is so instrumental for us on our traditions. Uh, nearly 4,000 hadiths or 5,000 hadiths have been narrated by Abu Huraira. The word Abu Huraira means father of cat. And the reason why he said that the Prophet called him Abu Huraira or father of cat, a loving nickname. Uh, there are interesting things about Abu Huraira is that he became Muslim only two or three years before the Prophet ﷺ died. So he knew the Prophet only for three years, but he had tremendous memory and, and he collected hadiths a lot afterwards. So he is the originator of many, many hadiths. Uh, I can tell you that I have yet to give a khutbah or a talk in which <laughs> if I select five or six hadiths to talk, one of them is from Abu Huraira, is one of the narrators. It's also because I stick to Bukhari and Muslim a lot more than other tradition collections. So, so these are important companions of the Prophet uh, that we need to, to know and respect. Uh, and uh, know our tradition, they can be sources of inspiration, they can show us how, how we can. Unfortunately, some of the literature focuses too much on battles, on wars, like for example, uh, why is Badr the cutoff? Uh, before the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to Medina, he suffered a, a, a period in which he was isolated and he and all the new Muslims were were put in a valley in which they were suffering from hunger for more than two years. So I would think that suffering with the Prophet for two years should count as, as something which gives them great status. I mean, they remain with the Prophet literally thick and thin for two years rather than in, in a battle, you know, in glory. So to me, that I think that people who were with him suffered with him. You know, it used to be so amazing that they used to be so hungry. I mean, if you go and look at that period, uh, and they didn't resort to violence, they did not resort to robbery or thuggery. They suffered in pain for nearly two years. And so th those are some of the companions who are tremendously inspirational for Muslims today, worldwide. If you're looking for heroes, we have to, and if you're looking in the past, uh, the, the stories of the Sahaba are, are, are probably the best places to find heroes who will inspire you to not only be uh, meaningful contributors to your society, but also to be good believers and good Muslims. So, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer, but I think we have only five minutes before it's time to break our fast. We planned a lot of things for this lecture. One of the things that we didn't plan was how tired I would be towards the end of the fast. <laughs> so, so, but anyway. Uh, SubhanAllah, things did go fine so far. John, if there's anybody who has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Otherwise, we're done. Fitzab, do you have any question? No? Can you give a brief description of the difference between the reverting and converting? Hmm? Can you explain this between converting and reverting? Uh. The word reverting is now used a lot uh, in the sense of uh, the African-American Muslim experience, Western Muslim experience. What they say is that many of African-Americans today are descendants of slaves who were brought to America after they were enslaved in Africa. So many of them were Muslims when they came to the United States to begin with. Uh, but later on, they were forced. There was a lot of religious oppression during the period of slavery. If people were caught praying Salah or teaching their children Arabic or Quran, they were literally punished. And so they were forced to convert to Christianity. So it took two or three generations, especially those who were not very literate. They were not able to maintain their deen, and so they became Christians. And so now when their children and their grandchildren uh, are coming back to Islam, they, they don't want to say that we are converting to Islam. They're saying we're just coming back home, so we are reverting 
to Islam. I actually met uh, a, a Lebanese. Um, you know, the most of the immigration that happened happened after 1965, but in the 1920s and 1930s, there was a lot of Christian Arab migration to the United States, uh, especially from places like Lebanon. Uh, Arabs who were Christians who came to the U.S. So that's why you have very famous Arab Christians in the U.S., like Ralph Nader is an Arab, whether George Mitchell, John Sununu, these are all famous Arabs. Uh, and Spence Abraham, who was the governor of Michigan, who was secretary of energy, these are all Arab Christians who are third, fourth, fifth generation Arabs. But when these Christian Arab families, they came to the U.S., they usually had one or two son-in-laws who were Muslim. So a lot of Muslim Arabs kind of sneaked into the U.S. Uh, in the late 1870s and 80s because they're saying, yeah, Majid, Sajid, Majid, they're all my children, and one of them is a Muslim. Who knows? The whole father has filed the papers. So many of these people came. But their children lost their faith, right? So now in Michigan, for example, when you go, you will find a lot of Arabs who are reverting. So it's not just African Americans who are reverting to Islam, but you have Arab Christians who are reverting to Islam, who say, well, who actually remember that their grandfather were Muslims or grandmothers were Muslims. So that is what reverting to Islam is. But I think the word convert itself is wrong. Yeah. You know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has already taken shahada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks all of us, am I not your Lord? And we said, bala shahidna, we have already all testified. Nobody, anybody who says I'm not a Muslim is not. I mean, in, the, in this world, yeah, but in a, in a metaphysical sense, in a spiritual and cosmological sense, it's not true. So nobody is converting to Islam. Everybody is just returning to Islam. They are reverting to Islam. So I think that word probably should be become the norm rather than being an unusual term. Done? Yeah, five more minutes. I'll be happy to answer another question. It's okay. If you have any other questions, it does not need to. Yes, go ahead. How can we use some of our soft powers from the examples of the Sahaba to create influence? Well, like for example, today I wrote an article about Bilal, and I, I wrote it in the context of this racism that is happening. Uh, racism is, I think, I call it America's original sin, and it's not just that white people are racist, even Muslims are racist. Uh, like I sometimes say jokingly that Masjid al Kausa's annual budget is less than the electricity bill of ISD probably, right? So there is an element of, you know, us versus them. And, and so the way we can go back is to go back to our traditions and see how, how we dealt with these issues. None of the issues that we face today are new. They're just, it's like the history is going through a, a revolving door and new old problems keep coming back as new problems. So if you go back in the tradition, you will find that there are solutions to that. So when you go back and look at that once uh, Bilal had become a Muslim, he was not treated any differently at all from the companions. So just like Salman and Farsi, there was no, uh, you know, the, sometimes people say they treat white Muslims as trophy Muslims and others as not so much of a victory. I mean, white people convert Muslims, take it as validation of their faith uh, when they don't do this with Africa. That was never the case. They never took Salman al-Farsi's conversion or Rumi, another companion, as, as validation of their faith. So you can take those traditions. But, but in order to do that, you have to have two forms of knowledge. One, you have to have the knowledge of your own tradition, and, and you should be confident uh, in your tradition, but you also have to know the circumstances in which we are living today and how to deal with it. In the last two days, America has changed incredibly. Uh, the Supreme Court has come up with two major decisions uh, supporting Obamacare, and then today, uh, gay marriage has disappeared. There's no such thing as gay marriage. 
This only marriage in America now, marriage equality. Is it's a huge moral transformation of this country. Uh, where are we on this issue? And uh, it's a very interesting dilemma. When we fight for Muslim rights, we fight under the same constitution that says everyone should be treated equally under the law. So where are we when it comes to marriage and other people? So some of these issues are also very important. So in order to be able to have impact, I think Muslims, you know, I will leave you with one tradition from India. There is this uh, scholar called Nizam al -Din. He He says, khidmat uh, al is what deen is all about. Deen is about service of humanity. And I think if Muslims get into that position as minorities where they serve the deen and others, if you think the serving of others is our part of our deen, then I think that's how we would be able to have influence and impact. Just after my fight.